Okay, and we're live. Hello, everybody. Again, my name is Pav uh, from Men with Purpose. Today, I have a very special guest, uh, Simon Bob. Thank you, Simon, for uh, joining in. So, a little bit about Simon. He's an actor, a men's facilitator, and also part of the marketing team for Mail Journey UK. Now, this is a network of men that promotes men's work, also organizing events around male initiations, uh, as well as other events and coordinating other activities. I personally actually attended um, a few of their men's circles that they're holding in Houston, in London. And also there's another one in Battersea, correct? Yeah. Okay, understood. So without further ado, Simon, thank you very much for being on the show. It's a pleasure. Thanks for asking. Thank you. So um, I normally like to, to start with just maybe taking a couple of deep breaths and seeing what's what's actually really present for you at the moment. Well, I've never heard a podcast start with two deep breaths. So that's, that's very good. I like that. <laughs> um, what's present for me is the sudden awareness of a uh, kind of nervousness. I feel like, mm. oh, how many people are going to hear this or see this? So there's physiologically, you can feel the kind of butterflies in the stomach, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. I'm, an, I'm an actor, so I guess I'm kind of used to that. <laughs> um, sure. Usually that feeling is kind of adrenaline. So it, uh, before you're going on stage, you actually want some of that. You, you, mm -hmm. want, you want a certain level of nerves that gives you that. But if it's mm -hmm, too much, mm -hmm, then it becomes mm -hmm, debilitating. Mm -hmm. I've actually... Um, I've, I've had to kind of uh, develop a relationship with my own nerves in uh, that feeling of I, I went on um, just the classic backpacking trip when I was uh, early 30s that many people end up going to find yourself, you know, that kind of thing. So I went to Southeast Asia and I, re I remember as I went through Bangkok Airport on my own with this backpack for a, a six week adventure thinking the hell am I doing in that sudden feeling of what I was really excited. And now I'm like, I'm here and I don't know where I'm going. I've got a vague plan, but the hell am I doing? And there was that kind of, Oh, anxiety, I guess. And then I had one of the best six weeks of my life. So <laughs> I, I almost said to myself at the time, remember this because uh, often that feeling in you, it's hard to know sometimes is this telling me to stop or is it should I ignore mm. that feeling and go hang on I'm this is just the feeling you'd feel before you ju jump off a diving board and have the a brilliant kind of thrill so I think that's what this is <laughs> it's gonna be the, the best hour of my life yeah I, 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 I think so too um <laughs> it, you know it's funny you're mentioning Southeast Asia I can definitely relate to the time when I hopped on a plane for the first time going to Thailand, landing in Bangkok and thinking, what the hell am I doing here? Like everything, I was a little bit like, not starstruck, but like a little bit overwhelmed by the incredibly tall buildings and everything is like moving. I was yeah. like, wow, okay. But again, I was kind of leaning into, leaning into my edge, so to speak. Like this is a little bit outside of my comfort zone, but it's like an interesting concoction and anxiety mixed with uh, excitement. Yeah. And of course, it turned out to be, I mean, I, I went back afterwards to live for like a year and a half. So, oh, wow. Yeah, but probably yeah, one, of the, one of the best times of my life there, for sure, mm. which we can get into. Um, perhaps for people that don't know much about um, yourself and the, the work that you're doing with Mel, should you maybe talk a little bit about what your, um, how did you get on this path of men's work and how did you discover it in the first place? Because I think it's, it's somewhat obscure right now and it'd be interesting to kind of hear your perspective as well with all of your experience. Mm. Um, well, it was around the time actually that I went on that trip or I went on the trip uh, slightly after I'd got into the, into the men's work. Um, and it was all out coming out of a time in my life when things had hit the buffers and where I'd, I had this extraordinary kind of two month period of my life where uh, my first marriage, which hadn't been going for very long, uh, broke up. And within a few weeks, I was also diagnosed with testicular cancer. So it was just one of those moments in life when it just goes. Whoosh. And um, I remember at the time thinking, uh, it, almost being physically and mentally aware that it had 
knocked me into a different kind of consciousness um that suddenly you were right at the edge of yourself and um i didn't feel massively stressed about it in the sense of i don't remember that time as being the most miserable time of my life i remember it as being really intense um i ended up being having an operation and then turned out i didn't have cancer at all but just the the period of living thinking you might have is takes you to a certain place in your mind wow and but in many ways it was it was the it was the relationship ending that brought up more stuff that needed to to be worked on and it and it felt like particularly going through therapy and all the rest of it, it felt like in fact that was the culmination of things i'd been working on or not working on throughout my 20s that had brought me to this point where i was now forced to confront what was going wrong and what had led to this relationship not working of course, a million complicated reasons why any relationship doesn't work. But mm-hmm. and then, uh, crucially, a friend of mine um, met up with me and said that he'd been on this thing called the Men's Rights of Passage the previous summer, um, and he thought that this was something that would particularly. It seemed he said it seems to me that masculinity is is an issue that you're really wrestling with through all of this. Um, in fact, another friend had already said that to me um, that. Something, there was always some, something symbolic about the fact that it was testicular cancer that seems to be um, wrong with me. Uh, it just seemed a coincidence, too much of a coincidence. Um, mm. So I was already exploring that. And then my friend said, yeah, I went on this thing called the Men's Rights of Passage and it blew me away. It completely changed, and healed, you know, sent me on a massive path to healing and gave me a new platform for the rest of my life. And so I, I looked it up. It was only a few weeks away. I had that I had a gap in my diary. I went on it. Um, one of the things he said to me was a, a, an element of this. It's a five day event happens in, in this country. It happens in Scotland usually, um, but they happen all around the world. Um, one of the key elements of it is small groups. So you spend a couple of times every day in a, in a small group of eight men or something. And he said the depth of sharing amongst those just something i've never encountered or experienced before and that's where the real healing was Mm. um and that was my experience there as well but it wasn't just that it was um there's a there's a ritual element to it there's you're there's the rest of the time you're in either big groups the whole everybody in one space or you're on your own um processing And, and there's a lot of it's a very much in the contemplative tradition so there's a lot of time in silence. Um, and it really revealed to me that I had been too much in my head. I'm naturally a very a very head cerebral person. And that had brought me to the end of, you know, that had got me as far as it was going to get me. Mm. And I now need to understand more about how to be in my emotions and how to be in my body. And that there was something uh, about being a man that, that men aren't, don't find that easy. And that's the other thing about the men's rights passage is that it, it, I think each of us, when our life hits the rocks, we are tempted to think nobody else has made such a mess of life. Like I have, like, what am I doing? It's that sense, sense of being confused and lost. That's really dangerous. And actually what this initiation experience, part of the teaching of it is that in fact, I was simply going through, um, a stage that is the classic male journey mm. that um, in fact, the point of collapse and crash or um, crisis is essential. And that from that point, then you start and then you grow. Um, and you, of course, ideally we would never, we would just grow beautifully without any need for crises, but, but somehow the, the gold and the magic is in coming to the end of yourself. Um, and then connecting with something greater than yourself. Now that may be that you understand that as God. It may be that you understand it as nature or simply the, the wider group of men or the wider group of of humanity. Um, but I found it hugely comforting to know that 
in fact, I was struggling with things. It was just my particular version of what many men, perhaps even every man, has gone through. Not just in the crisis, but actually the whole journey that had led me there. And to hear things like, after the age of about 30, your successes have nothing to teach you. Um, wow. That failure is to be embraced. Not in a kind of reckless or stupid way, but um, it's very much a countercultural philosophy that says that we live in a culture that's all about the upward path. Um, it's all about achievement, accumulation. Um, and as we're doing that, we, um, we tend to neglect what's deep down in us. And the problem is that just doesn't work because unless you're incredibly lucky or incredibly um, blind, what's underneath will come up. Hmm. Um, I mean, I could go on and on about, in fact, I would like to talk about, go into depth about that. Sure. But I'll just I'll give you a chance to. <laughs> no, I mean, there was, there was a very beautiful um, summary, very eloquently put. Um, and I'll, I'll definitely like to go deeper. Be, before that, for the people, who, uh, sorry, the, the men or the women that are actually listening to this, um, that haven't had anything, they haven't had any exposure about men's work and mayor initiations, maybe could you go a little bit about, not necessarily what happens at the, uh, events, although you can do, I know that there is a certain level of confidentiality there, but also a little bit about what is men's work, how is that transitioning into male rites of passage, what is that exactly, maybe a little bit the history around it, maybe a couple of questions there, but we yeah. can back to one at a time. Well, the history around it, um, the ancient history of men's initiation is uh, this idea, which is still practiced in some more what, what you might call primitive, but of course that's a loaded term, but um, <laughs> other certain parts of, of the world still. Um, the idea that the man, the, the boy needs male um, affirmation for his journey from boyhood to manhood. Um, that there is a, a, a wildness and a danger to, to male, to, to young men, which needs to be, not tamed, but framed, it needs to be directed. Um, and we can, again, just as a side, the, the concept of masculinity being tamed is actually something that can be explored as well, um, mm. as something that's potentially dangerous, the way our society has done that. But there's no doubt that, that young men need to be directed into a healthy masculinity. And, and primitive societies, or rather ancient societies, and still today some societies, would know, they knew instinctively, or through experience, that that can't be taught just through words. It has to be done through actions and rituals. And so they would take the young men at a certain age out into, uh, out of the village, into, um, into nature, because that was an essential part of it, connecting with nature and its awesomeness, and realizing that that is greater than you. Um, so there's a certain amount of wounding that is inflicted on the boys. That's obviously, uh, I think today we might feel uncomfortable with how that might be done. But the idea is you're getting to the point where you've taken the, the burgeoning male soul and given it permission to grow into a man. And crucially, men need to have, have another man, an older man, basically look into their eyes and say, yes. You're a man, now go. Um, it's something about that I don't know, I, I don't know if women have that same need, that same burning question that develops in adolescence of, am I a woman? That men seem to just, am I a man? Am I okay? Do I pass the test? Am I really a, a real man? And most men live with that for the rest of their lives. And it's how you, mm. it's your relationship to that question in yourself that will define so much of the way you live your adult life. Mm -hmm. And if that's not healthily dealt with, then all sorts of problems can come from it. So that's in the, the classic sense of men's initiation, to return the boys to the village in a healthy masculinity. In the 20th century, um, there was this men's movement encouraging men to um, be a bit more in connection with their own souls or emotions 
Um, and our particular men's rights of passage comes from the work of a man called Richard Raw, who is a, a Franciscan um, priest and uh, he's a, a theologian, a writer, but he particularly had a focus on men's work um, in, in the 20th century, uh, the, in the, probably the, the 1980s and 90s. And he went, he spent a lot of time studying these tr traditional male initiations and then created alongside one or two other people a modern version of it mm -hmm. because the feeling was that men that we we need male elders and we we'd lost generations of truly wise soulful men who could lead the next generation of men into wisdom and being soulful and that somehow there just weren't those men anymore to do that and so the plan was to create an experience that could initiate men into a much more deep and wholesome healthy relationship with their own masculinity and their own humanity to enable them to become elders who can then pass it on mm. um, and it initially happened in in the usa and it's been running in the uk for over a decade now uh, i went i did it in 2011 um i was 31 at the time and i was actually one of the younger ones there there's lots of men in their 50s and 60s even mm. um doing it and you just become aware that men are carrying so much pain mm. men individually and men generally are carrying so much pain and of course that's not to say that women aren't um it's just that men don't don't speak about it Mm -hmm. um, so the men carry it in a way that women don't carry it. Women share it. Again, these are massive generalizations and there'll be many cases of people that say that that doesn't apply to me, but, um, men, that's what's so beautiful about sitting in a group of men being vulnerable is it's so unusual and all the more powerful because men have f finally given each other permission mm. to say. So the question of what is men's work, I'd like to share an image um, that was spoken, that was shared on the Rites of Passage. And I've been, it's been in my mind ever since, but I was particularly reminded of it just the other day, listening to a podcast by a guy called Adrian Scott. It's called the Anxious Poets Podcast. I can't recommend it highly enough. Adrian is one of the founders of the Men's Rights of Passage in the UK, having done it in America with Richard Raw. And when I did it, he was my, what we call the weaver. So he's the main storyteller, the person in the big group who, mm -hmm. That's the tone of it. So, and he's a poet and his podcast is beautiful. The most recent episode, he tells the story, a story from a scene from Dances with, with Wolves, the Kevin Costner movie. Mm. I haven't seen the movie myself since I was about 12, but uh, the scene he talks about is the Costner character is basically living on his own out in the frontier of the Wild West. And he finds this pool of water and he needs a source of water to drink. But the water is, for some reason, full of the corpses of dead animals. And uh, in, in, to have any chance of being able to drink this water, he's going to have to remove each one of those animals out of there from, from the depths of the water. And then he burns them in a big pyre. And the teaching on the rights is that that is a brilliant symbol of what each man, each human, but the focus here is men, has to do. Because the carcasses of the animals were polluting the water. And until you are prepared to go underneath the surface and drag those things out, you'll never be your own whole, your own wholeness and well being will never be um, healthy. So, what's men's work? Men's work is doing that hard work of going into your your past, mm. uh, your traumas, your wounds, some of which others will have inflicted on you, some of which you've inflicted on yourself and on other people, some of which might go generations back. Um, and doing the opposite of what men have tended to do for generations, which is to ignore that and go, as long as I can stay successful, as long as I can have my achievements, I don't have to go there. And the key teaching is if you don't transform your pain, you will transmit it. Wow. wow. You can think you're doing fine, but it will leak out. Um, 
so men's work is is encouraging men to do that hard work and it is hard work of of looking inwards and being with your pain being with it within yourself but sharing it with with people other men that you can trust and then using all the many um skills and um different uh techniques that are on offer to help you work through it mm -hmm. um, and it's not just about looking inwards it, the, the long-term aim is that you will then be of service to your community yeah once, you, you once, give back mm -hmm. when you give back yeah mm -hmm. well i've never uh, i remember watching watching dancing with the wolves with kevin costner but i don't remember that particular scene and the way you trans like the, the metaphor that was actually given, I was like, whoa, okay, that, that's incredibly deep. Wow. Yeah. It really struck me when I heard it on the Rites of Passage. It's lived with me ever since. It might be a deleted scene in the movie. I'm not quite sure. But um because I haven't as I say, I haven't seen it for 30 years or something. But okay. um, yeah. <laughs> I'll definitely need to go and revisit that movie for sure. But uh wow, you you've put it in a in a very, very beautiful way. Um Let's maybe touch a little bit about why knowing what, what you've been through right now, why is it do you think that most men, and again, I'm hugely generalizing, there's a lot of men actually stepping into and doing this work. What do you think most men are maybe shying away from it? Is it the fact that maybe something like this isn't popular enough in our current society and culture? Is it because there's a lot of resistance from men? What's your take on that? There is an ongoing question, isn't there? What, what is innate is there a, something about the male soul which is just has always been there and how much of it is culturally mm. led i don't really know the answers to that and i don't want to get into it today because there's just different opinions about it what i do know is that there is such a thing as a male experience that is that most men would say yeah that resonates with me and that experience is there is an inner resistance to um, to talking about your your problems, um, and I, as I say, I don't know if that's something completely innate that drives us to want to be self sufficient and want to be strong. Mm. I, I think you know I mentioned earlier that every every man has that question burning in them: Am I a real man? And I think that's for most men that's intimately connected to the question of Am I strong? Mm. We, we want to feel the strength in our own body and the way we are in the world. And so we're frightened of weakness. We, we have such a sense that to be a man is to be strong that we don't give ourselves permission to be weak. Um, and so admitting failure or spending time with wounds feels like weakness. Um, plus there is huge societal pressure. And that goes back, I think, you know, culturally for potentially thousands of years that men's job was to, to go to war and protect the tribe and mm -hmm. go on the hunt. Um, and in, in our times, it was to, to go, um, go to war again. You know, uh, we needed men to do that. And so uh, it served society for men to bottle up their feelings. I mean, in our country, certainly what we call the officer class of, of men who were, who were educated at private schools, public schools, as we call them rather weirdly, but um, they were specifically, I mean, I went to a, I went to a private school and it was less like that, but still an element of it. You're being trained to run, to run the empire you're being trained to to be in charge of the British empire, which might mean going out to some colonial somewhere in India or, or, or wherever. And your emotions are not helpful in that regard. They need to be kept, they need to be kept in check like the natives. Um, and, and I still think in, in our culture, we've got some of that going on, but, but there has been a massive shift in the last couple of decades. Mm -hmm. So, so it, something massive is happening, particularly in the last five years. Mm. Men are, we're talking about it more, that men need to share their feelings. Mm -hmm. um, but there's still m huge peer pressure amongst men to stay not, strong. To, yeah, to not look. to do that, yeah. 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 I've heard that a lot of strong men actually suffer in silence, and 
that kind of explains it, right? The the moment you are are about to really step in and be vulnerable and open up and share, immediately somehow this equates to you being vulnerable or sort of you being uh, weak or less than someone else. Da da da, and that kind of closes yeah. everybody in. <laughs> yeah, there's a there's another beautiful sh- story I can share, which I think is a true story. Um, I was in a uh, in a group not a men's group actually just a, just a, a group where somebody was visiting who's a um a minister in on the somewhere in new england i think in the eastern seaboard of the us and he'd had one of his parishioners came to him we'll call him billy for the sake of his just in case um and billy uh was a, a gay man and a man of color uh, his job was working for the state department's um uh, team that uh, what would it be called um, diversity so encouraging mm-hmm. so, so when there's been a breach of diversity somewhere in amongst state employees he had to go and deliver diversity training now somewhere upstate was a penitentiary and as we know in America a lot of the the men are the prisoners are taken out to work on the roads or whatever mm-hmm, mm-hmm. huge proportion of them are black and some of the people who are subcontracted to keep an eye on them or to, uh, to basically guard them out in the community are people who live locally where the road is being mended or whatever. There was an incident in this one time of racism of the, the prisoners were, the black prisoners were being racially abused by the white local people whose job it was to keep an eye on them, um, supervise them. So Billy is sent down to that community to deliver training to this group of white men. And he's on the he's on the road driving down there, nervous as hell, thinking, "Here I am, a gay man, a black man. I don't know what I'm going to say to them." Mm. And he he gets he arrives there. He's taken into this barn, basically, sat in a circle of uh, proper big macho white men with rural, you know, I guess you would characterize them as Trump supporters in that sense of, you know, they have a certain philosophy of life mm. and, uh, and, you know, you can imagine how nervous he was. And this moment came to him as he started, not even knowing what he was going to say before he opened his mouth. And he said, isn't it hard to be a man? <laughs> and he shared a little bit about his own relationship to that being how hard sometimes it is to be a man. And I guess he must have finished by saying, anybody else feel anything like that? And somebody, one of the other, one of the men in the circle, maybe so, so yeah, I guess I feel this. Two hours later, the woman whose job it was to open the barn and let the guys in and out came because the session had overrun and she came in and she walked in and found a huge circle of men in tears, hugging, you know, Wow. That is the power of saying, of giving permission to men to be vulnerable. I don't know if you've ever experienced that, even just in the pub or or wherever. If you've just been brave enough to cut through the bullshit that men, is the comfortable level of conversation for men where we like to sit, which is talking about work or sport or, or whatever. If you just are brave enough to cut through it and say, yeah, I, I'm struggling in this way or, or even just talking about men's work. I've been in that experience where suddenly it can, I mean, I guess it could go the other way. Some, sometimes men will close ranks and go mm-hmm. gay, you know, sadly, <laughs> but it often doesn't often it opens something up and you go, mm. oh, you can see it behind the eyes, men going, am I actually allowed to, am I allowed to be honest? Am I allowed mm-hmm. to be vulnerable? Mm-hmm. It's an interesting thing that, you know, a lot of, a lot of us are actually looking unconsciously for permission from someone else, right? That maybe the father figure wasn't there. They didn't have to go through a rites of passage per se. And then nobody gave him that approval to say you are a man or you're worthy or, you know, it's okay to talk about these things. It it doesn't make you anything to do with your sexuality. It doesn't make, make you weak or doesn't mean that you're feminine, et cetera, et cetera. It's just, you know, basic human emotions that everybody, both men and women explore. Yeah. Experience. Yeah. Um, I think that, uh, yeah, it's, it's a, it's an interesting thing that men, um, 
I've read the book by um, Grayson Perry. Are you familiar with Grayson Perry? No. So he's um, he's an artist in the UK. Who, mm. he's, he's also become a sort of cultural commentator. He's made documentaries exploring different, and he made one about the modern masculinity, basically. And he wrote a book called um, The Descent of Man. The Descent of Man. How do you spell his name again? Uh, Grayson, G-R-A-Y-S-O-N, mm-hmm. Perry. Mm-hmm. He, P-E-R-R-Y. Um, so it's an interesting title, actually, Descent of Man, because it's a play on the book called The Ascent of Man, which was, I think, an anthropological study, and maybe, maybe it was a TV series as well, about evolution and the development of mm. man growing up out of apes. But the point, of course, of what we said earlier, the men's work is about the descent. It's about voluntarily going down. Mm, and the, mm. you know, But it's also explores the fact that masculinity is might be in crisis so the descent of of that in that sense but he talks about how every man has in his head an imaginary department of masculinity so if you can imagine a sort of a board of men in suits or not in suits maybe an army for army uniform uh sitting there judging everything saying is that masculine is that is that, is that manly enough are you does that qualify does that make you a real man and we're constantly checking with the Department of Masculinity, am I am I okay here? Um, wow. And unfortunately, without unless somebody stops us, we we do that to other men if we're not careful as well. Um, mm-hmm. So a lot of and he goes to uh, he, I mean this is why the male suicide rate is so high, and we talk about it a lot in men's work, don't we? Um, in his documentary, Grayson Perry goes to a couple of working class communities. And this is another whole different conversation is the extent to which men's experience of modern life will differ according to your social class or economic background that you belong to. Particularly those from lower economic backgrounds have been decimated in some ways by the loss of traditional work. Um, but also those are perhaps the backgrounds where men are most traditionally, there's the pressure not to be weak and not to be vulnerable and men in the pub and so he goes and interviews a group of men one of whom their mate committed suicide and and there's that horrible sadness of just i wish he could have found a way of i wish he could have said how he was feeling but you see how they all are in the pub and it's all about banter Hmm. there's Mm. no there's no permission to be vulnerable Mm -hmm. Um, and it's just getting that first giving people like you say giving people permission giving people and i think that's what the rites of passage is about it's not uh, partly we would like as many men as possible to go on it and to experience it because you can't really just read about it you have to it's a whole body and mind and soul experience that and that was the genius of it originally the, the instinct that traditional cultures had that it has to be something truly transformative psychically Mm -hmm. that you have to really, and it won't happen overnight. You can't just do it for an afternoon. You have to really go out of your life. So Mm -hmm. in in our rights of passage, you hand in your phone, your keys, your wallet for five days, you properly disconnect so that you can be. And of course it's not going to change everything in five days, but it's, it is, as it says, an initiation. It Mm -hmm. it begins something. Yeah. Um, so it's not just that we want men to go on the rites of passage, it's that we want men, we want society to be saturated by men who don't do the, that bullshit thing anymore, who, mm. who are able to give permission to themselves and to others, to, to men, to be vulnerable without being afraid. Mm-hmm. Um, so actually you're... We, uh, masculinity is something that you it feels very fragile for most of us if we're not mm. careful and that's why there's so much misogyny and homophobia from men it feels like it goes back to a that adolescent experience where you actually still want a cuddle with your mummy <laughs> when you're, you're becoming a man, but you still want, and that's terrifying. So you're in this weird relationship with the feminine, 
because you're aware of this little flame inside you that is your masculinity and you want it to burn brightly and you're afraid you're that actually it's really tiny and if you let too much femininity come near you that masculinity will be threatened and overwhelmed hmm. so so you have to the feeling that what you tell yourself what we tell ourselves is i must keep the feminine at arm's length whether that be women or or, or gay people i must keep them away because whereas if you're either by your father in your adolescence or by an initiation experience, hmm. if your masculinity is in, is affirmed so that you're more confident and secure in it, then you can start to allow the feminine into your life much more powerfully. Mm -hmm. And part of the, part of the male journey, our organization is called the male journey is to simultaneously give yourself permission for your masculinity to be wild and dangerous at the same time as giving your feminine side permission to grow and be, mm -hmm. be present. So you can, the aim is to do both and have them in balance with each other. Whereas too many of us are, we're too afraid to let the feminine in. So we're not in a healthy relationship with our feminine. And because of that, we're not, in a healthy relationship with the wildness of our masculinity mm, that mm. that feels dangerous too so we're not living the, and i'm still not you know I'm not, i've got a long way to go everybody's on their own journey yeah mm -hmm. yeah I, I wanted to touch upon something because i mean a lot of interesting points um you said that men can be in their masculine being a little bit more I won't say aggressive, but meaning a little bit more expressive. And at the beginning of the interview, you did mention something about the male energy being channeled, but also the male energy being, I think, was it manipulated? I can't, can't remember what, what um, the exact word that you said. Um, okay. Well, what's the difference? I think male, so Richard Rohr tells the story of the elephants um, in, in one of his books. He talks about how there's a, that, uh, the elephants, male elephants, when they're um, young, mm. sort of young adult, there is that masculine energy uh, that needs to be kept in check by a senior male elephant or elephants. And there's this one particular example where they, uh, whichever part of the world it was, where they, uh, the senior male elephants had been poached or died, and there was just the young male elephant, and they just caused havoc complete destruction mm. um and they solved it by bringing older male elephants into the pack the herd um so there is something about masculinity about the male essence of the masculine drive which is dangerous um and toxic masculinity which we talk about a lot has part of that is it is involved in that i think i think toxic masculinity is also in the in the human sense mm. it's the relationship between the masculine drive and the masculine wounds polluting everything so mm -hmm. but the masculine drive is dangerous if it's not um now in an individual man might come along i'm personally never been a huge sort of hugely masculine testosterone driven kind of guy um which carried its own problems of course my department of masculinity in my head has give always gives i mean i still have it i still uh struggle with the fact i can't i'm useless at putting up shelves and mm. parking the car and playing mm -hmm. football you know things that men are supposed to be good at i'm often not and uh, yeah, i continue to wrestle with with that but um yeah, so there are certain things that a man, so a man might be somewhere along the spectrum. Um, and actually that is your task, as a, that's my task as a man, is what each man should say to himself. Wherever I am on the spectrum between aggressive testosterone-driven masculinity or passive, not very confident masculinity, my task is to move is to, mm. in, is to embrace and enhance the other end of the spectrum in myself. Mm. Mm. That's a good way of putting it, really coming both, embracing both, maybe a little bit more 
feminine essence with the masculine essence coming it together in a healthy, yeah. uh, okay, healthy pact. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Interesting. Um, man, there's so many things like I'm listening <laughs> to you. I'm just like, getting, okay, that, that's, I don't want to lose this. I don't want to lose this. I don't want to lose this as well. Um, so you've been doing, you, you've been involved with this type of work for how long now? Well, I did, yeah, so I did my rites of passage nine years ago. Um, and then out of the annual, so each man can only do that once in his life. That's the rules we have. Like it's not, there are other, there are other events you could go to, to refresh some of that, but essentially the initiation is a once in a lifetime thing. And the and reason, I, sorry to interrupt, the reason behind it is that it's to kind of to mirror what, what happened in, with our ancestors where normally you'd have to go and kill a lion with your spear and that's kind of it. You're officially a man. I think so. I think it's also to stop, to stop men from keeping on coming back, which actually mm. would perhaps be um, unhelpful in your development towards maturity. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's, but it's also to men. This is one of the things you, you get taught on it is that, uh, men respect what they call hot edges so rules and boundaries um so actually when you go on the rites of passage you are uh, allowing the elders to be a little bit rough with you there are different organizations running rites of passage experiences mankind project is another one um different ones will feel a little bit more warrior like ours is more in the i would say there's more in the magician energy kind of mm -hmm, mm -hmm. tradition but there is still you're saying i give permission to other men for five days to tell me what to do and where to go and how to be um and i think it's part of that that's saying you can only do this once in your life so you need to respect this process um don't think oh well if i don't get it right this time i'll come back no you enter into it full heartedly. Mm. You do it once. Mm -hmm. I think that's part of it. I see. So it's really a calling for you, for you to really step up fully into this because there is no second turn. Like really take it seriously yeah. in, in a sense. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so I did that. And then, um, and by the way, I genuinely came out of it thinking I had changed from being a boy to being a man. I really did. Mm. Hmm. Um, uh, and then there are local groups that if you, if you're fortunate enough to live to live where enough to live where one is near you so i'm in london so there was there was one there and um, so i continued having contact with that philosophy and with other men who had been through it on in a monthly meeting um and then they also have an annual gathering called the moot which is any man who's been through the rites of passage they all gather once a year to just um, connect and to, and it's actually a business meeting as well because the, mm -hmm. the organization needs people to volunteer and to give permission to for, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, and the, the trustees of the organization after I'd been to a couple of those moots asked me to be on the board of trustees, which I did for a couple of years before I stepped away. I actually stepped away partly because I was still single at that point and I, th I sensed there was a danger in me that I was um, going to be, if I, I, it was actually quite easy for me to do men's work by that stage. Not, not my own personal struggles, that's always difficult, but to be involved in the organization felt a good fit, it felt good. It was something I enjoyed spending time doing more or less, but that was a chance that I might be neglecting my own personal development mm. by doing that so it felt like you know i very much believe in the wisdom of seasons there's a time for everything and wisdom is about and perhaps with the help of somebody else to, to help you navigate that there is a time where you go okay this season's ending and now this is this is something new so for me mm -hmm. it was a time to step away from actually being that heavily involved in in the mm -hmm. organization mm -hmm. to focus on finding a life partner again, which I mm -hmm. have now done and have a beautiful one year old son. Um, so, which by the way, I don't think I could have got to that place without the men's work and without not just going on the rites of passage, but consistently 
going to the groups to the local group staying in contact mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because to go back to that image of pulling the dead bodies out of the water uh you need help um hmm. it, you can't do it on your own you really can't and um the the tragic thing about men not giving each other permission to be vulnerable together is that actually when we do there's an incredible power uh, power is such a loaded word but i mean that in the purest sense that there's something about male energy that is hugely beautiful and the world needs it um, the world needs men who are completely comfortable using male masculine energy to to make the world a better place mm. um, and what happens the same may well be true probably is of feminine energy in a group of of women men in a group of, of just men your masculine energy get the level the echoes go round and the resonance in the group I, I, i'm sure i don't know if you could prove it in a science lab but you actually step away from the group feeling energized mm. um and you need that you mm -hmm. might also need a therapist and a, a counselor and a, you know all of that as as well mm -hmm. but um there's something about being in a group of men who are all doing the work together that that en en energizes you and gives you the chance gives you the support you need to do your own to mm -hmm. do your own work and the, yeah go on i um i i can resonate with that i've i've held groups um when I originally started this maybe a couple of years ago in Thailand originally, and you could see just a bunch of random men coming together and within 10, 15 minutes, some of them are crying, believe it or not, because it would just, it feels so natural mm. to, to be around men, to be, like I said in the previous podcast, to, to see, to come to see and be seen to, you know, and be heard as well. It's a very rare thing, especially for you to be able to kind of, metaphorically speaking peel the onions the layers yeah. of the onions and really come to what you're actually feeling uh, and that that's quite a task to do it's mm -hmm. for a lot of men for a lot of men it's quite difficult <laughs> it certainly is we have a, a specific format that we use for our circles um, different men's organizations use different formats we're very very um, certain that we're that we're very passionate about the one that we use it's called way of counsel uh, which is a a technique that's has its roots again in traditional cultures um it was developed particularly in california um in the last few decades um and it uh, is used by mixed groups women's groups men's groups the key thing about it is that it enhances depth because you can only speak if you are holding the traditional talking I say traditional because it's a cliche in men's groups, yeah, yeah. A, a stick, you're holding a stick, but it's, it's a really profound and beautiful thing. Uh, you have to listen if you're not talking. Uh, there are no interruptions, perhaps occasionally for clarification or something, but generally it's not a conversation. It's each man taking his time that he needs to say what he needs to say um, and then it moves on to the next person and they say what they need to say and we're encouraged to listen properly but the key thing for men about that is that there's no it, it helps to create a container that stops you from trying to fix other men mm. um, <laughs> because it without the container if we're just loosely having a conversation in the pub or wherever we can't help ourselves coming up with advice or suggestions again this is a generalization but it's often a problem that we as yeah. men experience is that and I've, I've been on the end of it with friends who go oh well yeah it's because of this or you should try doing this and he's like yeah something in your soul goes no i don't want that i just want you to go i just want you to hear me be seen as you say, mm -hmm. to see and to be seen, to hear and to you know to speak and to be heard. 
Um, and that is not, so the magic of the men's circle is not, it's partly the male energy resonating, but it's also, you find that your the pieces of the puzzle, of your own puzzle, you'll find that another man has the keys for it. Hmm, interesting. And you don't realize until you've heard another man speak about his unique experiences that have nothing to do with yours on the surface, but the, the connection and the resonance for your own life makes you suddenly in, in your soul or your mind go, yeah, ah, yeah, that's, that, mm-hmm. that works. And, and sometimes that, you might only remember one thing that was said in, in that evening, but it'll stay with you for the next month. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's the next piece of the puzzle that you need to, to, for your development and growth. Mm. You know, what comes to mind is, I, I can't remember who actually said this, but it was something along the lines is the more personal something is, the more universal it is, right? It's just really getting to that Absolutely. point where we're able to channel it and you hearing someone else verbalize this makes you, oh, wow, that's actually the thing I was actually looking for, but never really knew how to maybe express it or, yeah, maybe even like make it have a lot of shame around the whole notion of actually even putting it out there publicly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think that's actually one of the key um, secrets to script writing I've heard or writing of any kind that uh, if you make it personal in, in a story, if you make it specific, mm. uh, then then the receiver or the, the, the reader, the viewer can, um, can apply it to themselves. It's mm-hmm. a kind of paradox, but it seems to be true. My, my my buddy who is uh, a screenwriter also looking to uh, wanting to become a director so george shout out to george if he's watching uh said the same thing said the exact same thing you need to make it incredibly personal so you can take people on a journey with you so they can actually relate to their own experiences their own wounds and you know the healing that potentially they need to do so yeah i, I think it's uh, it's more common than actually people think yeah definitely yeah mm. uh question what would you say to someone who is let's say listening to to this interview right now and they're thinking oh about this probably a little bit too maybe feminine or i'm not really into kind of sharing my own feelings i probably don't need that i asked the same question to you to my previous guest but um yeah curious to know what what your thoughts are going to be if, if you if you were to hear a man saying to this after they've heard to the interview um I think there's no doubt that in our organization, we particularly attract men who are already more comfortable with the feminine side. Mm -hmm. Um, And I do, I do know that I do understand that that for some men, they really feel that they identify strongly with that more male essence. And, and I don't want to just, absolutely to say to every single man you need to talk much more about your feelings it may be that some men that's not quite the right thing for them i'm i don't know i mean i think the point is if you're feeling i think what every man needs to to, to, I, i am happy to generalize and say every man needs to be in a healthy relationship with their emotions because. And I mean, because every human needs to be, and it's mm. just that men traditionally have found that harder for whatever reason. Yeah. Whether you need to speak about them, I don't know. Um, but it tends to be that speaking about them is what helps you um, develop a healthy relationship with them. I certainly, I realized on my rites of passage that I had not got a comfortable, comfortable, healthy relationship with emotions. I was scared of my own, I was scared of powerful emotions. Mm. Um, I didn't know how to process them. So I would say for, for many men, many men find that um, martial arts or similar things are a really important gateway Mm. to the discipline that's needed because you do need some discipline. Um, And also, and, and I've never done martial arts partly Well, for most of my life, that would be because it just never appealed to me. It was just not something that I had any desire or connection for. Mm. I now sit here as somebody having done my being around men's work enough. I sit here as somebody that 
knows probably I would get quite a lot out of it and it probably would help me move on, which I don't know which martial art I would choose. But I'm sitting here. Jiu Jitsu. Start with Jiu Jitsu. That's what I'm doing. Is that your, your one? Okay. Yes, sir. That's, yeah. Well, I mean, I'm also sitting here with somebody with a prolapsed disc in, mm. in my lower back. So the thought of uh, <laughs> anything mm, 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 is mm, not mm. good. But uh, yeah, I mean, I. I perhaps need somebody to push me to do it. But, um, well, actually, my wife's very keen that we give our son uh, an experience of martial arts at quite a young age. Um, mm. just so That's that really going to help. I, yeah. I mean, I'm not a father, but looking back, and I'm, I'm 31 right now, looking back at my younger self, I would have loved to discover, mm. to have discovered um, jiu-jitsu at the time because it's, you're almost like in a physical fight, but without punching. So it's like really yeah. exerting a lot of power, which and a lot of tension that I think men need to, yeah. to really be expressing in a, in a healthy channel, in a healthy way. Um, and also teaches you a lot about confidence, humility, being humble, nurtures the sense of camaraderie. But again, maybe I'm biased. I've tried also boxing and kickboxing for a little bit. I found that jiu-jitsu is quite intimate. You're like really hugging another man uh, mm. and, or a woman for that matter. So, um yeah and yeah it does it does come with risks like every other martial art because it is a martial art but um if i was to choose then i'd definitely be my my number one choice mm, thank you i'll bear that in mind so maybe if i take him to um jiu-jitsu or whatever then i can do it with him and uh mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that'd be a, that'd be a way in so i think so i think for the man who you spoke about who is initially thinking well i i i can't see myself talking about my feelings i don't see where i want to um then the question always goes back to are you uh, what's going on in your life are you feeling stuck are you feeling that you're constantly bumping up against the same problems that are making you unhappy or the people around you unhappy um if that's the case then do something about it. Uh, don't just give in. Don't just think it'll go away on its own because it won't. Mm. Um, now, I would say, because this, this background I've become used to, go to a men's group and talk about it, uh, as well as perhaps therapy or whatever. But for many men, yeah, maybe that's not the gateway. Maybe you, Maybe you need to be around martial arts for a bit or to be um i think just have a part of your just to any man live just be aware is there a voice in your head that's giving you a hard time about am i a real man and what relation what conversation could i have with that voice in my head that might give me a bit more um autonomy over it you know mm -hmm. who's who's running who's running this conversation mm. That's a that's a good advice. I should I should probably preface this by saying that men's work in men's circles is predominantly where we actually sit down and talk with another with another man or if it's if it's to do one on one on one or in a in a group circle, the way of counsel is as you said. Um the couple of events that I've been to, particularly retreats, more of uh sim uh, probably resembling what, what you've experienced with rites of passage, there's a lot of actually activity it's not just you know you sitting yes. there and talking it's really actually engaging the body sometimes the breath going outside and doing something you know difficult physically difficult that really kind of brings this masculine this kind of rural, like um essence or energy out so it's not just about sitting and talking like the actual retreats and activities uh, are a lot more engaging with the body um, absolutely absolutely mm -hmm. it like i said before you you can't just read about this in books. You can't just hear about it in podcasts. You have to embody it. Experience it, right? Exactly. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's, it, I was, I was hearing, um, I'm, I'm working with someone right now. His name is Michael Gay, which hopefully I'm going to bring also on the podcast. He's saying that sometimes whenever, uh, let's call it traumatic events happen or something really intense happens for you, it usually occurs in parts of the brain that language is, not present there there is no language there it's mm. actually you have to work with the body with you know with the breath with movement uh to be able to really kind of face this and you know 
uh, heal it or incorporate it in a in a kind of a structured uh, constructive way so I do I do encourage also men who are listening maybe a little bit on the on the fence sitting here and thinking mm, is this actually for me give it a go give it give it a try I'm a little bit maybe biased again because this is kind of what I'm um, what I'm pushing in terms of the message out there but by all means go to certain events obviously now because of COVID it's a little bit difficult but um, yeah there's a lot more to it and it's also one of those things that it's difficult for you to convey into words you really have to go and experience it for yourself it's you can only be you know um what was the word i'm looking for um yeah you you can only explain so much with words you really have to go and see it for yourself this is one of the reasons why um you said uh, uh, at the beginning, I'll, could I tell you more about the rites of passage? And then you said, oh, I understand there's reasons why you can't. One of the reasons is not just confidentiality, it's that uh, there is a secrecy around what goes on on the rites of passage deliberately because you have to, um, you you mustn't go there knowing what you're going to go through. Mm. So if you, if you give your brain a chance to plan, uh, you know, if I tell you exactly what each day of the rites of passage involves, your brain will get ahead of you uh, and you'll be like, <laughs> okay, okay, so this is how I'm going to deal with this. Certainly that's how, what I would think because I'm very much like that. Um, that uh, there is something about being uh, out of your comfort zone. And so you have to, you have to have a vague idea of what the rites of passage is about and then just go and uh, give yourself permission to be on the edge and mm. like out of your comfort zone because that's where the ch- that's where the stuff happens mm-hmm. What, you, mm-hmm. you have to be in that place otherwise if you're comfortable no, it's not going to work uh, yeah i resonate with this so much um i think especially a lot of us are actually a little bit like right br- again generalizing here right brain overly thinking logical knowing the sequence of events you might be uh tempted not to participate fully which is kind of goes against what the whole activity or the whole event is about or you might actually not show up or support others so yeah there needs to be a little bit of mystery i think speaking to other to other men as well i can i can understand why they are a little bit reluctant to say what actually happens on certain events they've been to or they are actually currently facilitating because of because of that so you just use the word mystery and i think this is a really important part of maturing as a human being and as a a man um and our, our initiation program is about encouraging men to become more f- comfortable with mystery mm. um uh i'll say this as a question rather than a generalization is it the case that men particularly need to have answers don't want things to be mysterious that we want things logically kind of um we want to be able to put things in boxes and explain everything um and life doesn't work like that um you can have everything beautifully lined up in your life your work your home your finances everything and then there's an earthquake either literally or figuratively something happens and it just goes or something in yourself you start to go ah i feel really unsatisfied something's nagging and gnawing away at me and then i start not communicating with my partner properly or or whatever um and it's knowing how to sit with those um weird feelings of i actually i don't know what's happened here or the outside world has given me a conundrum that i can't solve uh i don't have the answers knowing how to go through that period in which we all have to go through it It might be once a year or might be once every 10 years in our lives and it might last for years we have to be able to have the skills to to go okay i'm not going to panic and panicking for men often looks like the midlife crisis doesn't it i mean you know we desperately will search for something to take us out of that place. It could be we want to go to what we, something that makes us feel younger, mm-hmm. whether that be the car, the uh, life, the hot, you know, the the affair, whatever it is that we feel that we want to do. 
there is also the danger for many men of giving up, of going, I can't handle this, but I think the best way of dealing with it is to go to the shed. Mm. Again, literally or fi- figuratively, is to is to just give up a bit. And so your mm. sex life, sex life will just die because you, that's just easier than confronting the challenges with it. Uh, and, and you just you suddenly become everything becomes more bland because that's the easiest way of coping with it. Whereas there is a way of navigating through these periods of uncertainty in your life. Um, but it starts with giving yourself, a, a, get, being able to be comfortable with it. Of course, the point is being comfortable with being uncomfortable. You mm-hmm, know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's, it, it's never easy. It's sometimes almost unbearable. Um, but again, being around men, other men who are going through the same journey is what gives you the courage to keep, to keep going through it. Um, mm-hmm. So another key word is liminality or liminal space. Mm. Yeah, expand a little bit on this because I think most people haven't heard, let alone understand what actually the term means. So I think it's quite crucial to to put a little bit more emphasis on that. So the uh, the limit or the liminality of something is the edge of something, or it's particularly the space between two other th- between two things. So um, in fact, the rites of passage, whether it be in the traditional sense or the modern rites of passage, is deliberately creating a liminal space. So it's a space where you're taken out of what you know, somewhere into a place where you don't know where you are. You're not comfortable or familiar with your surroundings or with the way things are going to work. Um, life gives us liminal space repeatedly. So a liminal space is that bit when you've lost your job and you don't have another one, or even you've got another one, but you haven't started it yet. Mm. Or it's where you, um, are about to go from being single to being in a relationship or from being in a relationship to getting married or from being married to getting divorced, being not, not having children to having children, um, uh, having a serious illness, um, something that completely disrupts your life for good or for bad, what feels good, what feels bad. And it's when you don't yet have, a clear sense of what the next thing is. Mm. And those times I would say are often when men freak out. <laughs> um, and men's work is, a, a, it's a, what I described earlier, it's about dealing with your wounds so that you can, can develop, you know, work with them and bring them into a healthier place. But it's also learning how to cope with liminal space because life will never, never stop giving it to us life just doesn't it's it's complicated and, mm-hmm. and, it, and it's hard and i think actually that's one of the great lies of modern society is that life is meant to be easy um it isn't easy life is really hard mm. but it is also absolutely full of beauty and joy at the same time so a healthy masculinity is one Again, a healthy humanity, a healthy soulfulness and spirituality mm. is one that embraces both and, and says, I am I know how to access the higher, healthier parts of myself and of the world I live in, which is why connection with nature is so important. But I also um I accept that when life gets hard, it's not because something has gone catastrophically wrong and I, I'm a failure. Mm. It's because life is hard. It mm-hmm. just, you know, the only question is how am I going to deal with it? Mm. And am I, am I going to deal with it with love or am I going to deal with it with bitterness and cynicism and making other people's lives harder? <laughs> and the dangerous thing is, well, the really hard thing is that sometimes we make other people's lives miserable and we don't even mean to. That's why you need to do your work. I speak to mm-hmm. myself. That's why I need to do my work. N- not yeah. just once, but continually, every day. Continually, yes. Because um, we all, and the other thing is, we all know that, and we might have, no matter what our relationship with our father, there will always be things in our father that, and I have to admit, it'll come to me. My son eventually will go, you know, that you gave me a whole load of shit to deal with there. And of course, I, I didn't mean to, whatever, but, 
you find yourself repeating the same mistakes. Mm. It, you can't stop it happening. You suddenly see yourself in the mirror and go, ah, oh, I'm doing the same thing. Um, what, what, why do you think that is? Because this, the same exact thing came up in the previous episode so for both me and for, for John, who was the guest. Why is it that we seem to be going into the same repetitive loop over and over that maybe our fathers did and just pass you know, over? There must be a genetic side of it, I guess. But um, uh, I guess it's, certainly if you've lived in the same house as your father, mm particularly through adolescence, you're picking up things without even realizing you're doing it. It's, it's happening on such a deep subconscious level. Um, so you're, what you're picking up is the way of dealing with things. Um, and so the men in on my father's side of the family, we, we have, certainly are a long history of men that don't speak much about emotions. It's not something we are comfortable with. So um uh, i think i would have i certainly noticed i'd pick that up and not not having a and not having any kind of fluency with talking about or it's not just talking about emotions it's about feeling them and not panicking about them or not, not just getting confused by what to do about the fact that i'm feeling really angry or i'm feeling really scared or or i'm really in love and that frightens me or you know um and I think that there is like an irresistible momentum to it being passed from father to son. Mm. And the scary thing is that it's unintentional on everybody's mm. part. Um, and so that's why it's really important to, to do your work because without some intentionality to stop it in its tracks, that ball that rolls, you know, that rolling ball, the snowball, you actually have to go, right, I'm stopping here. I'm going to just, I'm, you need to have some practices that enable you to have authority over your own life. Um, so whatever spiritual practice works for you, and it's not something you can do once you have to have as a practice that you develop. It The beauty of mindfulness or uh, that sort of practice is that, after a while, it actually gives you the sense that I am not completely a victim of my own head or my own emotions anymore. I have, you know, I've begun to feel that it's within my power to notice when something's happening inside me, to notice when a feeling is developing or, or even notice when I'm behaving in certain ways, which the first step is actually noticing it rather than mm. just, just acting and not, not paying any attention to it. And then secondly, to go, okay, I, I can do something about this because mm. I think many men are stuck in a feeling of powerlessness <laughs> over their own lives, over their own mm. behavior. Uh, it, it is possible to have, to have that responsibility for your own behavior. Hmm. And I think it's, it's, it's difficult, you know, easier said than done, obviously, but you know, really taking that responsibility, I think really contributes to you really stepping into more of your, masculine essence if you will um because I, I do hear the same thing right life is difficult everybody's struggling with it and if you could share because um i think it's probably going to be quite interesting for some of the men especially that they're listening or the the women that actually could send some of their boyfriends husbands etc brothers if you will what are the sort of men that actually come to to events like this say for example to the men's circle well what's your experience been like what's the type of man either you know i don't know family man or younger older again i would i would say that uh depending which men's organization you um have an interaction <laughs> with you might find it slightly different um but we um in the, the guys who come to our stuff our circles or events are a complete mixture of ages. So we've got guys from twenties through to sixties or seventies, wow. which is lovely. That's a lovely kind of balance, a mixture. Um, and therefore at completely different stages of lives. <laughs> um, so there's a mixture of guys who I think are at the beginning of the journey, looking for some support and some direction and some kind of something to hold on to. 
And there are guys halfway through or towards the end of their journeys who, depends where they are in, in, in their work, they might, have, might be in the middle of a crisis and they might have come along, just gone, I've just reached out to you because I know I, I something, I have something is deeply wrong and I, I need some help. Or there might be men who've gone through that and know that they need to keep coming back to the circle to, to stay on top of things or to mm. just keep the connection with their, the deeper side of what's going on. It's also important to say we have plenty of gay men um, mm. in our circles. Um, and I, I feel that's important to say because um, this isn't a traditional, you know, we don't define things in those old fashioned terms. Mm -hmm. um, it's anybody who has a, I was going to say it's anybody who has a male body. Now, of course there is the conversation, the trans conversation as well of mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. we've never, we haven't, as far as I'm aware, I don't think any of our groups have yet had somebody say, look, I'm in a, a female body, but I identify as male. Mm. Um, because like we, we definitely say, and perhaps this is controversial. It is controversial even in itself. We definitely say it's just for, it's just men. I, I firm, I there's firmly nothing believe wrong about that. Yeah. I think yeah. there's nothing wrong. Everybody seems to be kind of stepping on, <laughs> stepping on like, you know, uh, glasses, but like it is like, it is what it is. Like there yeah. is something, you know, specifically for men where they could really channel the energy that's quite a heavy and needs to be held in a group environment. There's nothing contra. I mean, we've got to the point in society where it's really controversial to say this, but you know, guess what? There is. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's controversial to have any group that excludes anybody else. Um, and that's for very good reasons that we've got to that point in society because mm. it's, um, uh, we want to be inclusive as much as we can, but mm -hmm. I, I absolutely believe it's essential that women have spaces where there are no men. Mm -hmm. And it's really important that men have spaces, not because women are toxic. And that's a really, another really important thing. So what you do, what I'm involved with, we're not involved in the men's rights movement. Um, in the sense of, uh, there's, there's, there's very little place, I think in what we do for men to come along and just spend the whole time talking about how feminism has ruined the world or. Oh like man, that. that's, that's, you know, that's yeah. a, a lot of victimhood mentality, yeah. right? It doesn't yeah. get anywhere. Like it, the easiest no. thing for people is to come and complain and like, look at me, I need attention. I'm a victim, yada, yada, yada. They don't take responsibility, but nothing to yeah. do with that. Yeah. It, it might be that an individual woman or women in your lives has caused you wounds. Fine. There's a space to talk about that. Mm. But um, I would encourage any man to come who's feeling like uh, the main problem here is women or feminism come to our groups and just sit with the other men and mm. hear how they're processing what mm. they're going through and, and just see that there's something much more fruitful in taking mm -hmm. responsibility. So yeah, there's, there's none of that going on, but I think, yeah, just to finish the thing about the trans, that's a really interesting question. I, I, I'd like to think we would say, okay, if you identify as a man, if, if that, is your identity and you would actually feel really uncomfortable in a women's circle, mm. then try a men's circle. But mm. we're at such a, a new frontier with that conversation that there's just lots of questions. But anyway, but the reason why I wanted to say about the gay men is that um, we've had gay men who say, I, I find it profoundly healing whether mm. gay men or bisexual men, I found it profoundly healing to be in a group of men mm. where I'm accepted as a man or just as I, just who I am. Um, you know, obviously many gay men have a, an extra level of pain to do with interactions with other men and mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. depart the department of masculinity and the, and the, the sense of judgment for not fitting in with how a man is supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And so it's very, very healing for, for gay men to come into a place mm. of, of masculine energy and to be completely not othered there. You know, you're not, mm. you're not there as the token gay man. You're there for just for who you are. And mm -hmm. if your, if your journey happens to involve being attracted to the same sex, it's really not, it's mm -hmm. as it's as relevant as you want to make it as part of yeah. your story. Yeah. Um I've so, been 
uh, sorry to interrupt. I've been part of a lot of men's circles, even events where we have a, uh, a lot of men who are coming in and openly stating that they're gay and the experience has been equally great. Like the, the, in, in, in terms of that sense, I don't make any divisions or at least I haven't seen any facilitators making any divisions like that with trans uh, women. Yeah, that's a trans men, let's say. Yeah, that's a different conversation. I personally, in, in my events, I think, or the men's circles that I'm uh, facilitating, I'll probably keep it only for men. And that's a, for a very good reason, I think. But again, that's getting into deeper into it. People are going to start up with opening a can of worms here, yeah. being politically correct. I'm not really that guy to be very politically correct because uh, it has an impact on the whole. But again, we don't necessarily have to agree on this, and it's a much, much deeper conversation. We you know, we can probably go into into that uh, perhaps another time. Um, what I wanted to say is, let's touch a little bit on on fatherhood because you sounds like you're a father, a recent father. What what what's that experience been like for you know for people that are maybe perhaps just about to become fathers or at that stage where they're starting to think about that? How did that change you? specifically as, as a man and who you are today? I always wanted to be a father. So, and that's not, it's not the case for some men. Mm. Um, it's, it's not, I've never known a time when it wasn't something, probably the thing I wanted, wanted most in life. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I was really excited about the idea of having a son. What I mean by that is before I ever was even in a relationship, there was something about, I'd love to have a son I, hmm. I don't know why. And so when we decided not to find out um, what sex our baby was going to have until, until we had the baby. So I had to do, I had to do some work with myself just to check in. Like if we have a daughter, if there's any stuff in me that needs to be worked through there, let's get that done. So that in advance, yeah, as much as so that she is as much the apple of my eye as, as a son would be. I don't think it was any old fashioned kind of, you know, or men want a son, you know, or maybe some, some of that, but um, I think it was to do with wanting to just pass on to, to, mm. to this, wanting that connection with a, another man, whatever. I don't know. Anyway. Um, and I'm sure that I would have just been completely, a, 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 if I'd had a daughter, she would have just been everything for me as well. My, uh, and there, so there's been a, a having had one marriage that didn't work and then taking a while to get another relationship. There's been a lot of my life. There was certainly a lot of anxiety thinking it would never happen. And then uh, we were trying for um, a bit less than a year without getting pregnant. So there was enough time there for anxiety to, to come in. And so my experience of having a child who happens to be a son and so far is healthy and very happy boy. My first experience is just gr gratitude. I'm just so, so grateful um, that something I wanted for so long has come to pass. I'm really keenly aware. I mean, I know many people in my family and friends who want, want or did want children and, and it hasn't happened either through singleness or through fertility or whatever reason. So I'm always really aware of that when I talk about it and, mm. and keen not to be smug. I'm just grateful. And, um, but it's also um, the, there is when, when you are, when you have a child and you wanted a child and, and it's, you know, the right time in your life, your most of your experience of every day is love. It's, it's, hmm. it's every day is full of love. Um, and it's the most, be I mean, I've lost my spiritual discipline in terms of sitting for 20 minutes every morning or whatever, meditating or reading a poem or sitting in nature, which I would have used to do. And as soon as he was born, I haven't got that back because he tends to wake up before we do. <laughs> um, and in the evening, of course that he's asleep. So that's when I could do it. But, well, I often have to work in the evenings because that's the only time I can when he's, mm. cause he's asleep, but also otherwise there's Netflix um, or wine. Um, but, 
in a way, I haven't felt the loss of that as much as I would have done because just being he, having a kid forces you to be present, which is a very healthy state for men, particularly to stop, you know, get out of your head. And that feeling of, I think it's also continued me the next step of my journey from being a boy to being a man of, mm. you know, I have, there's somebody in the generation below me now that is my responsibility mm. to care for and look after. Um, and yeah, that, that's what I feel. It's almost like another ritual initiation mm. in and of itself, right? That becoming a father. I've heard a lot of elder men or father, or sorry, men who are fathers already saying that that really made me a man to, yeah. to, to really become a father. So <laughs> I totally, I totally get that. I, I feel again, I, as like I say, I felt another level of embodiment into hmm. being, a, being a man. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's a massive challenge. And I, I'm even now feeling a sense of, uh, am I going to be all the question? Am I going to be good enough? Am I going to let him down? Am I, um, at the moment, particularly that as he become now he's one, he's got his own personality more and more <laughs> and, and he has the ability to say, no <laughs> or to do things that we don't want him to do mm, um great. so excuse me so my relationship with um my relationship with disciplining him is something i'm working on yeah mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do, you, do you think that um maybe there's added pressure or somewhat pressure of the fact that you've been exposed to this kind of work because you know once you get into kind of men's work or you go through an event especially there is no, at least what I've, what I've seen, there is no turning back. This kind of stays with you for a long time and you can't help yourself but to make parallels between what you've experienced on a men's circle or on a, particularly on an event, not so much on a, in a men's circle, on a men's group, but on an event, not relating to and passing over some wisdom, knowledge, experience, if you will, to your son. Do you think there's added pressure? Well, do you know what's interesting is I, I can think of two elders in in our organization who are the most um wise and beautiful men who have teenage sons or no a teenage or even no sons in their 20s sons in their 20s who have experienced that feeling of this is hard and mm. it, it i think feeling that I think it, there is a pressure of like, if I'm supposed to be, um, have got the answers, <laughs> which you say to yourself, you know, well, I've done this work. I've been doing this work for decades now. Um, why can't I, why is my own son just not responding in such a way, you know, or why is he um, having such struggles or, or whatever? And it must be incredibly frustrating mm. when you feel like you've got, you've got some answers to feel that, you, but then that's, that's life, isn't it? You, you, you bring up a, and you're bringing up another completely different human being with their own journey and their own personality. Mm. Um, the, the writer and um, theologian Henry Nowen is a beautiful book called reaching out. I think he's got a section about child bringing up children and, and he, his philosophy actually from the perspective of a priest. So I don't think he ever had children, but was um, uh, you have, you're inviting a guest into your home. <laughs> mm. um, and so it's, I think that comes under the section of hospitality. Um, so you're offering hospitality to this other person for as long as he or she is under your roof. Um, and then, a wider kind of hospitality for the rest of their lives, but you're, they're not your robot. You know, you didn't, they're not a creature in that sense. You didn't manufacture them. You just, mm. you, you brought them into your life. You gave them your genes and then you gave them a space to become a separate person. Mm -hmm. And I think that must be a, such a challenge for every parent of how to balance that of, how to balance the desire to control with the the importance of letting go. Mm. Oh, I'm that's a whole a, other that's a whole other podcast for men. Yeah, 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 for the, sure, for sure. Question, the question say. of control and letting go. Yeah. Wow, 
I'm not there yet, but I'm sure I'm going to have to kind of wrestle with these questions and, um, yeah. yeah, having really, it's going to be quite a challenge. I, if I'm lucky enough to, you know, to have, to have kids. Um, so I think we can spend probably another like five hours without any preparation. Well, if anybody is still listening or watching, then congratulations. We've been going on for over an hour and a half, haven't we? Wow, time flies, right? Same, same when you come to a men's circle, yeah. time flies yeah. so quickly. Um, okay, maybe let's, let's put a pin on that. I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of other topics that you can dive into. Um, if people want to learn a little bit more about you, the work that you're doing, the work that you're involved with, where, where could you uh, point them to? Um, so the web, the website for the Mail Journey UK, will you be able to put a link? Yeah, of course. Yes, yes, yes. On that. Um, so you can, you can find out based just the basic information on the website and mm -hmm. then you'll find that about the events you could go to. It may be that there's a local group um, that's near you. Um, we have, other, there are other organizations that run that basically it's an umbrella or a, a brotherhood of organizations across the world that mm -hmm. run the same rites of passage with mm -hmm. a different local flavor. So uh, there's several in Europe. There's uh, obviously the U S uh, there's Australia. Um, so depending where you are in the world, you might be able to access this kind of thing. The Mail Journey UK is our particular branch for this country, but Illuman is the US version. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, going to a local group is a good way to access it. Um, if you want to read more about Richard Raw's philosophy on that, there's um, two books that you could look at. One is called Adam's Return. And the other is Wild Man's a Wise Man. It's mm. worth saying that the both of those are from a Judeo-Christian, they have a Judeo-Christian heritage in them. Mm -hmm. So uh, you would need to give yourself permission to be in the presence of God language mm. Uh, mm. and Jesus language, but it's not heavy handed. It's perfectly possible to read those books and to take lots of wisdom from them mm -hmm. if, if that's not your own tradition. Mm -hmm. And also one more question, because I think it's important for people to, obviously they can go and check the websites because of the, the whole COVID situation right now. Are you actually running any events? Is that done in yes. person? Is that done in, okay. Yes. Uh, so the London group, we, um, before COVID, we would, we had two meetings a month, one in Houston and one in Battersea. Um, those are online now. Um, so there's a, uh, the first, Tuesday of the month, sorry, the first Thursday of the month um, or the third Tuesday of the month. Mm -hmm. um, and if you email London at mailjourney.org.uk, that will come through uh, to find out more information. But also nationwide, the Mail Journey UK does have a, uh, I think it's still holding Zoom mm, meditations, basically, where you can come and... Mm -hmm. So that's a slightly different thing because it's uh, actually, is it, I think it's just a meditation. There may be a circles as well. So there are various, and it wouldn't just be the London group doing um, a men's circle, which is actually where you are sharing and talking. Other local groups will be doing the same. Yeah. Some of our groups have closed, are closed. So you, you can only enter at certain points in the year. Our London one's completely open. Um, so this, there are, there are zoom um, forums for, mm -hmm for getting in touch with it and being, being present with us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Anything else, any final thoughts, anything else you want to add? I think we've said enough for now. <laughs> quite a lot. Yeah. I think there's yeah. a lot of people need to re-listen to this to kind of catch all these uh, insights and mini value bombs that you're, uh, that you put in into our conversation. Okay, folks, that's all for today. Thanks very much. Uh, stay tuned for the next episode and I'll see you soon.